And we are live. I'm Jane Ellen, and I'm here with J.P. Morgan and Alex Schultz of Photography Talk. Alex, this is going to be a big thing, isn't it? It is. Welcome, all you photography talkers, and welcome to the first episode of the Photography Talk Success Interviews. As Jane has pointed out, we have a exciting first-time guest speaker. Uh, very exciting. Commercial photographer and director J.P. Morgan has been shooting celebrities and exciting companies in Hollywood since 1987, including celebrities like uh, Jamie Foxx, Whoopi Goldberg, Holly Berry, uh, Keanu Reeves, Jay Leno, corporate clients such as Pizza Hut, McDonald's, and Pollo Loco, California Lottery, and believe me, the list goes on. So, J.P., welcome to the show. And we are live. I'm Jane Ellen. Oh, you have uh, you have your uh, YouTube open somewhere, don't you? That's going to be a big thing, isn't it? Isn't that what we have open? Let's close it. First episode of the Photography Talk Success Interviews. As Jane has pointed out, we have a exciting first time guest. Okay. Does anyone have um, their page open where this is also streaming? Okay. I don't. I don't. Right. I'm aware of. <laughs> oh. Good. I'm glad it was you, not me. <laughs> so it's too All right, late that's to fine. On the other person. <laughs> okay. It's okay. Okay. So anyway, let's try this again. JP, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here, Alex. Great awesome. to be with you today. You know, I have to. I have to ask JP. You have quite a, an impressive list of celebrities that you've shot. Can we ask who is your favorite? Do you have a favorite? You know, the best time I've ever had with a celebrity, about a year or so ago, I was out at Jamie Foxx's place, at his house. He has this huge mansion here in L.A., and he goes, hey, do you want to see the coolest place on my property? And I said, sure. So we jumped in his little four-wheeler, and we drove this really scary little road, <laughs> and I thought we were going to die, actually, a couple places. <laughs> but we got top of this property and looked out over his, uh, his uh, little mansion and his area there, and it was absolutely stunning. It was gorgeous. And he was just a fun guy, great guy. Oh, uh, that's joy nice. Joyous movies. Now, before we get into the, the actual core of the interview questions here, JP, I understand you have a new uh, business coaching series that you're starting up. And you know, Photography Talk has been a, a fan of uh, the Slanted Lens for a very long time. So, you know, if you don't mind, can you share some with the listeners here some of the, the details about this and how exactly does it work? Well, for me, the most difficult thing about photography is not taking pictures, but it's running the business and making it profitable and making it so that I can make enough money that I can continue to do what I love. So at the Slanted Lens, we've just decided that we want to share the business knowledge and perspective that, that I've gained over the years, and we're doing this in a weekly call. It's like a coaching series. We meet once a week. We help people set up their businesses. We help them understand how to run them, how to, how to price things, how to develop portfolios. Uh, really how to market themselves. So it is a, it's a hardcore business and sometimes people glass over when you start talking about business but it's probably the one area in this industry that is really addressed the least. So we hope to make this an area where you can go and understand the business of photography and make what you love to do profitable. That's really the goal. How exciting considering right now photography you have a lot of folks out there looking to reinvent themselves as photographers so I really see that uh, as something that's really going to get people excited and help them kind of fast track their way to to success. So, you know, let me ask you this: since 1987, you know, let's kind of you know jump over to some of these these questions here. What inspired you to become a photographer to begin with? You know, I was going to be a lawyer. I was convinced that I was going to sit at a desk and write uh, briefs or whatever it was all day long. And I was in a couple of classes in college and. I started looking, glassing over and looking around going, I'm going to kill myself if I do this the rest of my life. <laughs> now, I, could, I could tell then it was never going to happen. But a buddy of mine said, well, you love taking pictures. Why don't you make a, you know, why don't you make a living taking pictures? And I'm going, can you do that? Uh, I'm not sure if you can. <laughs> you can do that. I was excited about that thought. I took some photo classes. I got more and more into it. And I realized, though, I realized early on, I'm at the wrong university. I'm getting good information here, but I've got to go to a really a place that will really teach me about photography. So I went from I graduated from that uh, Brigham Young University, and then I went to Art Center College of Design. Um, 
you know, that's no reflection on universities. A lot of times just aren't tooled to teach commercial photography, which is what I wanted to do. And I've seen that change at universities, but I did, definitely needed to go to Art Center College of Design where I would really get a very focused commercial perspective. So. Wow. So do you remember your first camera? Oh, absolutely. A little Minolta, you know, 35 millimeter, you know, SLR. I just thought I was on top of the world, you know. Little zoom lens, you know, it was a pretty nice little camera for the time. So all film, Alex. You don't even know what film is. You know what? I'll have to Google it when we get off this. this yeah, thing. would you? <laughs> now, do you have a preference? I mean, do you, I know some people just uh, like vinyl records. Yeah. But I'll explain what those are later. Yeah. Uh, but do, do you have a preference and you say, I know I'm going to do this, so I want it on film and digital, or is it and not digital, or does it not make a difference to you? Well, film is killing the uh, the digital market slowly, but uh, very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> no, the reality is I haven't shot film in so long. I just, it is too easy to work digitally. It's, the workflow is there. I love it. I absolutely love it. I, I wouldn't shoot film again. It just doesn't intrigue me. There's a lot of fine art applications, and people love it, you know, for the, mm -hmm. the fine art aspects of it. A lot of wedding photographers today are shooting on film as kind of their thing, oh. which I think is very cool. And with the hipster movement and this whole, you know, that whole sense, it's it works for them. But for what I do, it's digital. Do you know why? If I spend thirty thousand dollars to set a photograph up, the last thing I want to do is wonder if the film's going to turn out. <laughs> and I did that for years. I mean, I'd set up these huge shoots, and then you'd send the stuff off the lab and just pray that everything was going to be okay. You know, so now I see it as we're shooting. I know I've got it. It just the the ease and the comfort of that is amazing. So. Well, now, do you remember your first sale as a photographer? The first buck you made in photography. Well, it's interesting that that question is interesting to me because I tell people, especially in our business class, if you're not starting to shoot immediately, you've got to gain value. You've got to understand there's value to what you do. So. Early on, if your friends start saying, get a picture of me, you start saying, well, I'm going to charge a little bit for this because this is what I do. You know, you got to learn to have value in that. So I shot. I shot for my friends. I shot for different uh, clients that I picked up when I was in college, way back in the very beginning. Once I realized I wanted to do photography, I started doing that. But really my first job for me, I took and printed a calendar, a single page, had one of my images, and we mailed 5,000 copies of that calendar out every month. Wow. And we started doing that when I first left art school and started my business. So I got a call from a guy who said, I'm not sure if you're going to want to do my little job or not because it's not a lot of money. And I'm thinking to myself, I've never shot anything. <laughs> <laughs> but they saw our pictures in our calendar and they thought we were so established. That, and I'm going, we'll absolutely shoot whatever you got, you know, whatever you got. Uh, <laughs> so he, that call, though, and then the calls just started to roll in, you know, because – the, the marketing that we had done, that calendar that we sent out, put us just immediately on in the market. People thought we'd been shooting for 20 years, you know, and I'd been out of art school for 20 minutes, you know, so it was uh, a very interesting uh, process. And that's, that's a, another key point that you bring up and the success or failure with photographers, I'm guessing, in your, uh, uh, your new uh, business coaching session, you're going to talk about the, the marketing side of things, because you could be the best absolute photographer out there, but if you don't get yourself out there, if you don't market in the right places, uh, not much is well, going to happen. No, I, I tell people, spend less on equipment, more on marketing, because when you get more clients, you can afford to spend more on equipment. Indeed. And so it's just it's a chicken and egg thing for some people, but for me, it's really clear. Market and then the industry comes, and then you can afford to establish and set yourself up however you'd like. Great advice. So now, tell us about a time in your career, JP, where you failed at something, and, and tell us how did you overcome, how did you pivot from this? You know, I had clients who I was shooting stills for all the time, and they're going, well, can you do a commercial for us? Can you shoot video? Can you shoot film? It was all film then, so I said, I'm sure I can. So I shot my first film piece for one of my clients and it was awful it truly was awful I mean we're looking at the stuff and I'm going this is just awful <laughs> and I knew it and the client knew it and so on my dime I brought everybody back and we reset everything up and we shot it again but in the interim about a week I did some 
a quick study about some things that I realized I needed to fix mm -hmm. and how I directed and how we shot. I was much more clear on my boards, so I knew exactly what shots I wanted to get. It was a very good learning experience, but the commercial that came out from that was for um, uh, back then Comedy Central, and they were really they were thrilled with it after we reshot it. And so it kind of made me realize that you know you can't jump into a new industry without educating yourself. And and uh, but I was thrilled to get into that industry. I've loved doing video and film, and direct commercial, directed commercials for years. So. But I think maybe the difference is you realized it was awful, and a lot of people. They do something awful, and you know their mom says that's great work, and they go, "Yes, it is." How do you how do you tell someone who wants to do this for a living that you're really not talented, or uh, you need to learn something? It's like the, the first episodes or episodes of the American Idol series. <laughs> you see a lot of that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I always tell people when I talk to them, I say, "Put your image up." And get out there and show me the greatest uh, uh, images and photographers that are working today. And put your image right by theirs. And now mm -hmm. look at it and think about it. You know, where are you at? You know, what do you need to learn? What do you need to do? You know, get six or eight images that really show what, are, what is current and uh, what is really considered good work. And how, if you put your image with those images, does it live there comfortably? If it doesn't, then you got some things to do. You keep working at it. Now, speaking of learning, JP. Have you had a I've made it moment? And and tell us a little bit about that. You know, I I guess for me, I was sitting on the, the back lot of, lot of Warner Brothers. We had literally a huge office built that looked down the street out the windows. Uh, we had Warner Brothers, we had a fire department a fire truck there, we had a scooter blasting through the window, it was breaking through the window. And there was a crew of probably 30, and this is for a still image. And I remember stepping back as the sun was setting, looking at this whole thing going down, going, I don't think it gets any better than this, man. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm going, it was just, it's what I love to do. I was building sets. I was on the back lot. We got special effects with fire and fire trucks and everything. And I'm going, this is what I've always wanted to do. Can't get any better than this. Wow. So you're you're on a you're on a set. You're having this aha moment, realizing like, wow, this is this doesn't get any better than that. So you know, kind of, I think a good segue into the next question. How do you balance a what I'm sure is a demanding photography career and your your personal life, your family? Boy, that is really hard because everyone is always being pushed and pulled between what they have to do at work and being able to take care of family. I'll tell you a quick story. My son once told me, you got to be at my, my violin recital. It starts at 7 o'clock. So I'm on set. You know, I'm pushing things along. I'm realizing I'm in trouble here. I got the, the shot done, but it's like 7.05. You know, so I drive like crazy. You know, I get there at 7.25, almost 7.30, and people are milling around. I'm going, I go up to my son who's sitting in his chair. I'm going, I am so sorry. I missed the whole thing, man. And he goes, no, you didn't. I told you 7, 7 o'clock. It doesn't start till 7.30. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my 10 year old so they realized that they kind of have to prime dad a little bit to make sure he's where he needs to be and uh, but you know I tried to always on the other side of that I had complete flexibility I tell the crew I'm gonna be there at 10 this is what I want you to do before I get there and then I would go and I would go to my kids presentation at school or go to you know so I had a lot of flexibility as well I had a lot of control on things I did and so I realized I needed to exercise that control. Good people that I hired could take care of a lot of things. I could take care of the things I needed, needed to do with my family. And I mean, we work long hours here. If we don't work a 12-hour day, it's just uh, it's a short day. So, so I understand the balance, but you can create the balance. Awesome. It's all about time management. So let's let's jump out of the, these questions for a moment and let's let's talk about a few of your photos. Um, okay. I would love to. Okay. And I believe Jane is pulling them up for us right now. And so, you know, if you don't mind here, uh, when these photos come up, you know, talk us through these these series of photos that Jane's going to show here. And if you can, uh, you know, what sort of challenges did you face with some of these photos and how did you overcome? Oops. You know that first photo. Is it up there? The the uh, dog being blown into the into the uh, kitchen. We have. 
I'll have it up here in a moment. I'll talk. I'll talk a little bit about that shot, though. The reason I wanted to look at that is this is is really pivotal about my career in the beginning. This is a single. This is a single photograph. No retouching. Uh, everything is exactly where you see it. So we've welded structures to support people. The whole set is put on, uh, is lifted up on one end so that we can nail the guy's shoes to the floor and he can lean forward in the snow. We're dumping fake snow into the door with a big fan. There is no Photoshop, no retouching. I mean, that's the way we started out in the beginning is we truly had to do everything in camera. Wow. So it was not an easy process. And, and, and listeners, we're, uh, we're trying to pull these, these images up. Uh, incidentally, at the end of the, the show here, we will have all the images. In the case you missed these images, uh, the image that JP is talking about right now, it really is oh. something to, to appreciate. Sorry, uh, so there's such a thunderstorm on. I've been muted, and when I go to the photo, I see it, but I, I can't tell if you can see it, so I have to back out. So I'm going to screen share it again. Oh, sure. Okay. And you just tell me if it's there or not, because I I don't know yet. <laughs> oh, that's attractive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's one of my better images. <laughs> yeah. That's odd. It's JP, while she's pulling that up, I have to say, you know, when you first take a look at the the image before you see the 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 image that comes after that that shows the elaborate setup. You know, and the you know today, you know, most folks have Photoshop, Lightroom, or some sort of photo editing program on their computers, and you know people are becoming really good at composites. And I think you know, you're talking about back in the day, you know, the heydays of film, and James talking about vinyl records. And so you take a look at this photo, and you think, okay, it's just another composite. But then when you look at the next shot, and you see this huge set. You know, the diagonal, these people hanging uh -huh. on, everything coming in, you get a brought that up. You get a great appreciation of how much how things have changed just from Well, they, they have changed. They have changed. You are in a world where you created everything in camera. You now gone into a world where you really can piece it together with different pieces. And I do that now all the time. Trust me. Is it there? We, Guys, is it there? I don't see it. No. A black screen. Ah, uh, okay. Well, what we will do is we'll paint it. You know, we'll paint a picture to to all the okay. listeners here. Then all the you know what I'll do? I'll post it in the photography talk stream. Sure. Okay. Um, and I'll mute so you don't hear the uh, mother nature. Sure. And then at the end of this show, as I shared, we'll we'll be giving a link to where all the listeners can find everything about JP, this interview, these photos, uh, all within uh, the photography talk site there. So. Let's let's punch here, forward. Here. Actually, Alex, tell me if you can see this. That's a heck of a storm you have going on over there, Jane. Oh, here we go, listeners. So here's the shot that we're talking about right there. JP, can you hold that back up, please? Okay, let me get it back up there. That's this is from a book uh, of my images called The Slanted Lens. Not that I'm selling my book. That's years ago. <laughs> uh, not doing that. But there's the image. It's basically this guy. He is uh, leaning into the wind. His wife is being blown up in the air, and you see his dog uh, being uh, blown back. But the way we shot it, there we like go. This. So there you, the we whole go. the whole set has been tilted up on end, so we can nail his boots to the floor. There's a structure comes through the wall for the the lady to lay on, and there's a structure for the dog. I asked my dog trainer, can we put a dog in this metal structure? He goes, are you crazy? And so I called my neighbor and said, hey, I want to take a picture of your dog. And so they brought their dog over, and uh, the dog sat there. We put a little sweater around it. worked out really well. So that's, that's the extent we went through to be able to get an image to work uh, back in, that, in the beginning. I mean, it's much easier now, obviously, because of Photoshop and the things you have to call upon, and we use Photoshop all the time. But... I think it makes people a little lazy at times. Sure, and on Photography Talk, as I shared earlier, we, we share, we're a big fan of your the Slanted Lens videos, and you show behind the scenes how you're making a lot of these, you know, these elaborate sets, even for some of your, your current shots right now. And there's a lot of work that you put into that, JP, so certainly, uh, you know, big kudos to you on that. 
Well, thank you very much. It's a lot of fun. I love to build. I always tell people if you want to know who you are, it's a sum total of your background. I loved shop in high school, and so I would build a cabinet. I built my mother's cabinets, redid her kitchen one summer. I just loved to build, you know, and so that became an integral part of who I am in the, when I do photography. I like to build sets to solve problems. It really so, shows in your really shows in your work, JP. Just absolutely impressive. So let me ask you this here. If you could go back in time, what advice would you give the 21-year-old JP? Uh, there's absolutely no question about this whatsoever. I would get more business uh, experience in college. Uh, I would get a, either a business minor or in some ways I, I felt like I needed more business uh, background before I started. I got tons of photographic, I got great photographic knowledge at BYU, I got great photographic knowledge at Art Center College of Design, but in the end, I just didn't have any business savvy. You know, I had to teach myself, and, and that was a slower part of my, my business. It took me years to figure that all out. Awesome. And now you're going to be sharing all those nuggets with other uh, photographers looking to get their career started in, uh, in photography. I think that's, it's, you know, what is it, uh, giving it back, uh, uh, Paying it forward. Paying it forward. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's fascinating. When I I've just finished a series. No, I'm not finished. I'm in the middle of it. I go to Dallas next to shoot for a bank, and in this series, we're shooting dentists. And I can tell you without a without a doubt, at least six out of the ten dentists I've asked them what would they do different. They said, I wish I would have gotten more business experience and knowledge. We're in this niche, just like doctors, like dentists, photographers. We're trained to do a specific thing, but now you're sent out there and say, go make a living at it. And uh, you really need that business background to make it work. JP, isn't that three out of four dentists? Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. Okay. Right after they brush, they take a business class. Uh, all your images are up in the Photography Talk stream. Uh, so Good. if you want to talk about the steampunk one, uh, that's there. People can view it or not. Okay. You know, the images, again, the steampunk, the reason I love doing that is I love a combination of not just the, the sets, but we built a set for that, small set. That seems like a small set to me, although my wife said, your concept of what a small set is kind of a little uh, out of whack because it's a pretty involved setup. But... We built, painted, and created that whole setup there. We had an old clock in uh, our storage unit we used from a Federal Express ad that we shot. Uh, we had a big fan that we used from another project, and we just pieced those pieces all together. But the wardrobe is really what makes that happen. My wife found a great corset. You know, we had a stylist who, uh, who came in, Julia, and she found all the other pieces we need. Then uh, Terry Groves at Makeup Magic, she put together everything for us. So, you know, it's really a group effort. It isn't just me. I mean, you have great uh, people who are helping with the uh, wardrobe, the styling. It kind of all comes together to create the image. But I just, I love the image. I love the, the sense of it. Any kind of weird subcultures like that I think are a lot of fun. So, awesome. Very, very good. Thanks for sharing that with us. You're welcome. Now, jumping back. So, you just shared with us what, you, what advice you'd give yourself you know, give the 21-year-old uh, JP. So let's ask a different question in the sense of what is the best photography business advice that you've been given? You know, uh, I had a man who was a photographer. He said, you know what? He said, you love photography, and that's good. He said, but don't let your love of photography keep you from being able to make a living at it. Awesome. And so, and as he elaborated on that thought, and that is that, you know what? Sometimes because we love it, we just want to do it, and we're willing to do it at, uh, you know, not get paid or not uh, get paid what we should get paid. And so as you, when you step back and look at it, what do I need to do to make this uh, so that I can do what I love and make a living at it? When you combine those two thoughts, it works. So that thought from him was really powerful for me. That's awesome. So now, JP, you've clearly branded yourself as somebody very unique, uh, and let's call things as they are. We live in a world of carbon copies. What advice could you give to those seeking to be unique and unlike others in such a congested industry like photography? Boy, it goes back to that comment I made a little earlier. Look at what your experience is, what you love to do, what makes you who you are. 
you know, and take those elements and put them together and try to bring that into your work, and that'll help you find a new place. You can't be ignorant of what's going on in the industry, but you've got to use that as a foundation to push forward with what you can add to the industry, what you bring to the table. You know, whether it be like for me, building of sets, or whether it be for someone who really is into fashion design, or you know, has an interesting perspective about who knows what. I mean, I had a good friend who was very, uh, just a great mountain biker. Loved to mountain bike. Uh, was out every every chance he could. wasn't sure what to do with his career in photography. And I'm going, you're doing it every day. You're out there riding your bike every day. You wear the clothes. You know the people. You you know, you understand that industry better than anybody. And when he turned his work towards that industry, it took off for him. That's awesome. Great, great advice. Uh, so now, JP, we've been we've been toying around with the talk about film cameras, digital. Do you believe technology is making better photographers or allowing for better photography out there? I think the biggest uh, kind of mistake I see in the industry right now is I think people, because it's digital and they shoot images, they do lighting by exposure. That is, I'm just going to expose for it and blow everything out. I think we've lost any kind of sense about how to light, and I think we need to stay stay in touch with that part of this process. And I think that's what's lacking. People are just uh, a little uh, little less likely to learn how to light and understand it, but their work improves completely. You know, it's interesting because I tell people a photographer who just shoots by exposure and can find great light or do those kinds of, that's great. But for me, I'm a commercial photographer. And that means on Monday morning at 8 a.m. in front of this building, I've got to shoot this group of people. I don't have the option of, I can't, well, let's take them to a great window to shoot on. You know, I have to light it there. So I have to be able to control light, augment light, and to be able to make it happen when I schedule it to happen. And that, that makes it it's a much more difficult process. So I think that's, been, that's the lazy part of the process. We just kind of, uh, we don't light like we should. And we get on Photoshop and try to fix it later. Now I have a question. If you know how to light well, can you perhaps um, get by on not the best of the best camera because you know how to light? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, a well-lit image. Look at this. People are making a living uh, shooting images with their iPhone, putting them on, you know, on the web and selling them. I mean, if you understand what makes good light, if you can find it, if you can create it, I mean, that makes the image. Well, it's, it, that isn't the whole image. It goes into the other, other portion of this is content and communication. You know, mm -hmm. are you really, are you telling a story? Are you communicating something? And I think that that also becomes an area that as we just click away, we don't concentrate enough. We don't produce images as much as we just try to find them. And I think that process of producing images, the right talent, the right clothes, the right location with the right light tells my story is a really powerful uh, path to go down and I think successful photographers are doing that path. They're, they're creating their images. They're really telling their stories. That's awesome. So now we were talking about earlier, uh, you know, a lot of folks out there are, are reinventing themselves as, as photographers. Now here's a question for you. Assuming that you had your, your camera, you had your lens, you had your lighting gear, uh, but like many out there, you had a limited budget. So let's just say you had $500 to spend uh, to get your business started, your photography business started, you have your camera, your lens, your lighting gear already. How would you spend that $500, JP? You know, that's a, that's a great question because, again, it's got to go back to marketing. How are you going to reach, uh, reach people? Like this friend of mine who, well, I actually have another gentleman I've worked with uh, who really loved being outdoors and doing outdoor imagery. And so what did he do? Well, he took that $500 and he went to every outdoor show he possibly could where every manufacturer of outdoor equipment was going to be at. Took his small portfolio, which was very focused, showed he could do outdoor work, and he talked to all these mid-range mid manufacturers, and they started hiring him to do images. So he was out marketing himself, going to where the people who are going to hire him are at and showing his work. Now, knowing that you've got to have a portfolio that, that – really supports what you want to shoot because they say good advertising puts a bad product out of business faster. So you've got to have a good product and then when you go out and I would spend that $500 on reaching the people who are going to hire me and either that is through going to conventions where you're going to have this group of people together 
or going to uh, you know websites, sending out in invites, not invites, but sending out images. I have a gal I know who's worked really hard. She does individual prints, gorgeous prints, but she has a targeted group of people that she wants to expose her work to. She mails them out one each month of these numbered prints, then she prints that up, and that's her marketing program. It's done very well for her. Right. Networking is key. Now, the setting up a portfolio, because I know a lot of photographers out there the, the idea of setting up a portfolio, how many photos do you put in, to what to include in there. In the slant of my business coaching uh, sessions that you're, or series that you guys have coming around the corner, uh, are you guys going to address as far as how to set up a portfolio and how many photos, what to put in there, and so forth? Absolutely. I, I mean, it's something you need to understand completely. Uh, you need to understand what images go in, how they work together. Uh, obviously, everyone has got to have an online presence. You know, so you need to host them someplace where you can get access to them. I show my portfolio on my iPad most of the time these days, although I still send out hard copies occasionally. You know, that's still a, there's still a need for that. So yeah, we'll go through completely go through that whole process of setting up a portfolio and hosting it, and making sure. You know, the biggest mistake everyone makes is they fall in love with their pictures, and you almost have to have someone go through and say, you know what, that's got to go, and. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's hard. It's like letting your children go. You know, it's like you're gonna have to put that one on the shelf. You know, put it up in your bedroom, but uh, everyone else shouldn't see it. Now, did someone do that to you and take away a picture you thought was fantastic? You know, I got a lot of that at at Art Center. I remember putting an image up once that I thought was amazing, and the teacher just looked at it, looked at me, and he goes, "What were you thinking?" And what handed it back, to, handed it back to me. I, it was a shot I'd done of myself, self-portrait. I'm going, what? What do you? What do you mean? What are you thinking? You know, I mean, it was just so brutal. But when I looked at it, and then I, I going, okay, I went through the process. What does it look like compared to everyone else in the class? I'm going, what was I thinking? You know. So I went out and reshot it, and uh, you know, that's a good thing. It, it's a good thing to fail in photography, because mm -hmm. it means a couple of things. You're pushing the boundaries. It's you're pushing yourself. But it's a bad thing if you get upset about it and you just kind of collapse inside yourself. It's a good thing if you take that information, build on it, and go out and redo it again. I can't tell you the number of times that I have reshot an image because I look at it going, that just didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so I'll put it, set it up again, and I'll go back and I'll shoot it again. A lot of times I'll leave my big sets up so the next morning I can look at the images going, you know what, that just didn't work. Or you know what, I love it. You can tear it down. You know, but give myself some time to think about it and to kind of get away from it all and to just evaluate. Yeah, I forgot where, where I read it or where I heard it from, but there was a, uh, a quote that I heard that some of the most successful people, uh, how they got to where they are, it wasn't because they had a, a gold path that they followed. It was because that they failed more than others. But the key point with it is when they failed, they knew how to get up and they got up quickly, whereas others that you know, just they fail, they sit down, and they, they don't have that rhino skin and they remain down and they build up a barrier between them and uh, the, the industry there, whatever that they were doing. So, JP, what are some uh, resources that you use on a regular basis for your, for your photography business? Well, when you say resources, what comes to my mind may not be typical for a lot of people, but I'm just very close to Hollywood. We use everything in Hollywood, prop <laughs> houses, uh, you know, special effect houses, uh, just about anything we can use, we just love to take advantage of. Uh, so we use those resources constantly. Uh, we just were, one of the last lessons we posted on the Slanted Lands, we were shooting at a cemetery. Well, I went up to look at the cemetery, and there were no gravestones, none, no headstones. They're all below ground. It's supposed to be a 1920 cemetery with headstones, and there was none there. So we're just kind of, this is the day before we're supposed to shoot. And so Jolene goes, forget that. That's my wife. She does so much production. While I'm worried, Jolene goes out and fixes it. You know, I'm going, oh, we're, the whole shoot's away, you know, Tara, what, you know, Jolene's already on the phone, called three prop houses and go, I got, I got 12 gravestones coming, we'll have them here in an hour and a half, you know, and in, in the end, we just decided, forget, we're not going to pay the money to be at the cemetery, we just did it in our backyard, and so uh, it's the last image, it's the Day of the Dead image we have on the, uh, up on our website, the Slant of Lens. 
So it, it's a matter of the industry is easy here. But you know what? It's funny. It's interesting to me. In any city you live in, you can create your own industry. And a lot of times people are pretty excited about helping with a photograph. You know, a guy who does this or a gal who does that. You know, you just you create your own industry and you create your own uh, kind of support system where you're at. So uh, it just it's as easy to work. Uh, it's easy to work in Hollywood, but you can create a way to work just about anywhere. That's awesome. Good advice. Now speaking of resources, you know, what are some must-have items in the J.P. Morgan camera bag? You know, I can't shoot without several things. I cannot shoot without my 70 to 200 millimeter lens. I got a Tamron 70 to 200 millimeter lens, 2.8 lens. I use that constantly. Mm -hmm. um, I can't go without that. I actually love. I have a Red Rock micro rig for doing destabilization. I love handheld. I love the the fluidity of it. I love how quickly I can work with it. I use that constantly. Um, I use my uh, the, my timer to do time lapse. I'll mm -hmm. show up at a site. I stick a camera on a tri tri tripod immediately and start a time lapse going. Then I go off to do what el what else I'm going to do. So I've I've got several cameras going all the time, but I can't live without a uh, time lapse going and a way to move my camera around and and uh, a couple of key lenses. So is there something Great. unusual, non camera related, that you always take with you? Non-camera related. That's a good question, Jane. That is a great question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I usually carry a studio box, so I've got some place to sit occasionally, and I carry a foam knee pad so I can get on the in the dirt, ah. you know, and I can, and you just buy them at a gardening shop, you know, it's a little, little square, it's not that big, I can kneel, kneel on it, I can lay on it, I can lay my camera on it, um, I usually stick that in the car so I have it with me. Actually, you bring up time lapse. It, you know, instantly, the first thing that comes to mind. Remember that video that you did on the the lawn with the uh, the little gnome? Yeah. <laughs> and you're, that was such a great video. You know, I'm gonna have to post that up for for the readers to listeners to to view that later. Such a great. I think that was one of the first time lapse I saw of yours, uh, JP, and it was just fantastic. Must have watched that at least 12 times. <laughs> well, you know, I was I was tired of just seeing clouds in time lapse. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something different in time lapse. So I did snails, popsicles melting, and a gnome being smashed. That was my time lapse. <laughs> it's, Jane, you, you know what? You got to, it's such a great clip. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post it later. That's great. Now, now, JP, folks are looking for duplicatable success. Yeah, they, what is your all-time favorite photography related book well because I love light so much I think Michael Greco's uh, lighting in the and the uh, uh, dramatic portrait is what it's called it's kind of the Bible in some ways about lighting portraiture in the industry great book it's been out forever you can buy it used on Amazon uh, it's just a great book and probably one that I've in the beginning I've read I love the way he works love the way he lights it's a great book like many of the readers out there, always picking up new books, knowledge. It's a great way to piggyback off of somebody else's success in your own leisure, all that other fun stuff. Yeah. There. Very cool. So we're we're working on a lighting book right now. We hope to have out by mid uh, mid next year. It's a little. It takes a while, so it's going to probably be a year away. Oh, but. fantastic! The uh, now is this off of the the slanted lens series, correct? It is. Yep. Very good. Very good. I've uh, I've watched your. Uh, you have a DVD out, uh, do you know? We do. Yeah. We have a DVD that's really the basics of how to get started with strobe lights. You know, whether it's you know small strobe flashes to mid-size to higher end uh, pack and head, really just gives you very basic information on what to buy, and then goes into how to use it. So it's a, a great DVD. Fantastic. Yeah, I watched it. Uh, some, actually, right after the uh, WPPI show a couple of years ago. Or last yep. year, right? so, May I say you're beautifully lit. Oh well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> no, no under eye shadows, none of that. <laughs> so, final question, JP, and this is a fun okay. one. Okay. So here we go. Life has been found on another planet, and none other than Sir Richard Branson is piloting Virgin Galactic and has put together a team of engineers, do scientists, doctors, and has asked you to come along to document the journey. Now the challenge is, you can only have one camera. Two lenses and two other items. Oops, two other items. <laughs> what would it be? Is that two other items or <laughs> myself here? <laughs> so what yes, would those two other, other two items be? 
Um, so let's start off with what camera body would you bring with you? I'd bring the Mark. I, no, sorry. I would bring the One DC. One DC. One DC because I can shoot a lot of video, and some of those video images I can, I have that video I can use with the images. I can pull the images and have stills from it. It's a great camera. It's a 4K camera. It's a really, it's like a twelve thousand dollar camera. It's a great camera. Fantastic. So now the the two lenses. So I'm guessing you might bring your Tamron 70 to 200 with you. But what would be the other lens that you would bring? 2470. I would do the 2470. Yep. That'd be a hard choice. That 1635, I'll miss. Uh, but if I could only take two, I'd probably do that 2470. Um, I don't know. I would have to. I would have to really think about that one. <laughs> it's a. It's a tough. The 2470 is. A, I use that quite often myself. But the the 7200 is. A, it's a champ. Yep. It's a great, great, great camera. A great lens. When so, I go past that. Yep, uh, two other would, items. I would have to have a tripod and I would have a, a an LED a light. And okay. the reason I take an LED versus a strobe light is because I'd try to I'd want to shoot some video as well as stills, and that would give me the ability to do both video and stills. That's okay. a tough call though. If I had the third thing I'd bring would be a strobe head. A strobe head. Now we're looking for specifics here, JP. So tripod. Are we talking aluminum, carbon fiber? You know what is oh. your What's a good tripod uh, that you can recommend to? A stack of books. Yeah, <laughs> a stack of books. Stack of books. You know, you uh, there really is a great series. Vanguard mm -hmm. makes great tripods. They made tripods forever. I have actually bought Vanguard tripods all over the world because I'll forget to bring a tripod, and so I'm in some little camera store in, in uh, Bolivia, and mm -hmm. I bought a tripod, Vanguard tripod there. But they have a high-end professional series that are all carbon fiber. I think it's a 230CT is a great mm -hmm. tripod. Um, that is a foundation is great, but then I put a video head on it, and uh, it, a Monfrotto head is what I use on that tripod, and that really gives me my basic. I can do video on that. I can do stills. One of the reasons I love that 70 to 200 millimeter lens is on that video setup, I can flip the lens and I can go into a vertical shot, and do stills, and um, so it's got the ring on it, so I can flip the lens and not have to use the tripod to to go to a vertical. Now you so brought. That, Oops. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, now you brought up a strobe earlier. You know, do you have a, a specific favorite in that side? You know, the, the strobe right now that I'm using that is really portable that I would haul in a situation like that is the Triton that is made by Photoflex. Oh. I mean, that Triton is lithium battery. It's lightweight. It's small. You know, you got like two to 400 watt seconds out of that, that setup. Uh, it's just really easy to move around with and to use. I and mean, that's what I would use. I mean, that's a really great entry level uh, to advanced level uh, piece of equipment. Some people may say it's a little high end for entry level, but uh, it's a great piece of equipment. It really is. Uh, it's just small, compact, and you're able to use it in just about any situation. So, I've used one my, myself and can definitely appreciate where you're coming from. The battery pack, I mean, it's just a little tiny. Little tiny little, little thing. Yeah, it's a lot of punch in a small package. It really is. If so, I could only take one LED, and it's because of the way I work, I have used these already. Um, it's a single LED. Uh, it's made by Photoflex. It's called the North Light, North Star, North Star. Sorry, North Star. And it is a, it's a video head. And I'll sorry, let me back up here. It's a strobe type head. It has a single LED in the front. It's daylight balanced. And I can stick all of my uh, all of my modifiers on it, like my beauty dish, my soft boxes. It's cool enough to use my cool soft boxes that are a little softer. And so that LED is just just a, a million lights in one. Um, I think that's you know when I'm doing stuff on set, it's really a great piece of equipment. So now that's is that battery powered or is that AC? You know they're working on making that battery powered, which would finally seal the deal for me. They need to do that. I use right now the panels that are made by um, uh, ICANN. Those are great lights, but they're square and they're hard to modify, you know. And I've always, I, I've always said I want an LED that gets back to a format that can modify, and we haven't seen that yet. And this North Star really is the first generation. It's a, it's a 100 watt light, so it's the equivalent of a 1K. So I sound like I'm a sales uh, thing for that. It's not the case at all. It's just a matter of it's a light that works, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, well, you're loaded up. You're out there and shooting the journey. So, 
Now, before we go signing off, uh, can you share with the listeners where they can find you on the web, and then we'll say goodbye. Okay. Uh, we have theslantedlands.com is our web page. It really ties back into our Facebook, uh, but more importantly to our YouTube. We post uh, twice a month on the Slanted Lens, so theslantedlands.com. More information will come about our business series. We're in the beta test right now. We're go doing it weekly with a group of 10 people. Uh, we'll roll it out to just the general public here in several weeks. So you just have to sign up for our newsletter at theslantedlands.com, and from there, you'll get a notification when we're going to open that business class up to anyone who'd like to join us. So that's really where you find us. Uh, my personal website is JP, uh, JP Morgan, J-A-Y-P-M-O-R-G-A-N.com uh, for my work. And uh, so there's where you find us. Fantastic. And all you photography talkers, you can find all the links and details about this interview um, at photographytalk.com forward slash JP Morgan. So thank you all for joining, and we'll uh, see you next time. Thank you, JP and Alex. Thanks so much. Thanks,